Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like, gla- are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of it, out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Thank you, Sarah. I'll just pray for Costa before he preaches um, uh, the message tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word um, that reminds us of of who we are and what you have called us to. We thank you that we get to participate in this great mission, the mission of God um, that that seeks to rescue people and bring them from darkness into into your light. I pray for Costa, and I thank you for, um, I thank you for his, um, his faithfulness, and, um, and I pray for him as he, as he speaks your words to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you've had a uh, great day. I've had a great day. I've loved being here. I love, love meeting many of you. And uh, now the uh, best bit is still to come in terms of looking at these words here from 1 Peter. Some years ago, a man by the name of Michael Hart wrote a book entitled The Hundred Most Influential People in History. He went down from 100 to 1. Uh, In third place was Isaac Newton. In second place was Jesus Christ. In first place was the prophet Muhammad. When asked why he'd put Muhammad at number one and Jesus at number two, Michael Hart replied, I am neither a Christian nor a Muslim, but the influence that Muhammad has had on Muslims seems to be much greater 
than that, that, that Jesus has had on Christians. Now, I wonder how you react when you hear Michael Hart's words. Surprise? A degree of shame, maybe? It's certainly a challenge, isn't it? And a challenge that Peter will reinforce for us today as he speaks about the outworking of our faith. Because a living hope in Christ, such as we saw last night, will always lead to a different life. Salvation always leads to transformation. For as Peter said, has already said, we have been cleansed from our sins. We have been set apart to be different. And the profession that Jesus Christ is Lord must therefore be shown by a demonstration in our lives that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is, the world will always want to squeeze us into its mold. We'll want us to become like them. But if we are different people, we are different people, then we will live in a different way. Uh, yes, we are to build bridges in order to cross them with the gospel, but we're never to assimilate into uh, the culture and become just like everyone else. Uh, the world doesn't like it when we're different. You may have heard about the man who went out to buy a grandfather clock and uh, he um, uh, went uh, round the uh, corner and um, uh, just as he was walking around the corner and um, uh, he, he went to the shop and uh, got to the shop and he said, I'd like to buy a grandfather clock. He got this uh, clock and uh, uh, paid for it. And then um, the person said, do you want it delivered? And he said, no, 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 it's all right. I only just live around the corner. Uh, I, can, I can take it home. So he put it on his shoulder and uh, went out down the street. And then just as he was going back around the corner, the back of the clock swung out and knocked off a passing cyclist. And so he put the, the clock down and picked up this uh, poor fella. And he said to the, the fella, are you all right, the, the cyclist? And the cyclist said, uh, slightly annoyed, he said, well, yes, he said, I I'm absolutely fine, but why can't you just be like everyone else and wear a wristwatch? Uh, now, um, the world, you see, will say to us, why can't you just be like everyone else? Why do you have to be different? And the answer is, from what we saw last night, we have to be different because of who we are. In fact, who we are is actually more important even than what we do. What we do is important, and we saw in those verses there, we will be judged by a God who is a father who is impartial. But who we are is even more important because who we are will determine what we do. And the key is to understand that what we do is an outflow of our new identity in Christ. Peter has been at pains to show we have a privileged identity, and we looked at that last night. Chosen, cleansed, set apart by the Holy Spirit. Someone who's been granted, a people who've been granted the promise of an inheritance. Uh, as followers of Jesus, we have the past, the present, and the future taken care of, all taken care of. There used to be a type of ice cream in the shops, too good to be true, too good to be true. And that's really the message for the Christian. These blessings, they're almost too good to be true. We have to pinch ourselves every day. Now, everything we then do is to flow out of who we are. Because we are different people, we are to live different lives. The lives that we live will not convert anyone. No one will become a Christian because they see us living differently. You can't, because you can't interpret the gospel out of that. Uh, to become a Christian, they need to hear about Jesus Christ. But the way that we live will be the foundation for the proclamation of our message. It will cause people to take notice. It will cause people to see that our faith makes a difference. It will show people that Jesus Christ is real because it makes a real difference. And as we see at the end of tonight's passage, in fact, a couple of verses after what were read for us then, it will help people to see that the message is good because the quality of lives it produces is good. You can't have the talk without walking the walk. And so Peter says, be who you are. You need to live out who you are. Uh, I heard one piece of person say recently that we need to outthink the world, outlive the world, and outlove the world. Matthias reviewed two books for us before. That's outthinking the world. And what Peter's got to tell us is how to outlive the world, and we'll see how to outlove the world as well. Uh, three things that come out from this passage. I've had to be fairly uh, selective, uh, missing out bits along the way. First of all, because we are people of hope, that's who we are, live focused lives. 
be who you are. Because we are people of hope, live focused lives. Verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. In other words, because you are people of hope, set your hope on the grace to be given when Jesus Christ is revealed. We noted yesterday that the people around us, contemporaries of ours, will have hopes as well, but their hopes will be tethered into this world. They're limited by this horizon. And we would naturally be the same. We'd be fixated on the visible, on the experiential. But if we're going to be effective in mission, we need to be different than that. Remembering that we are people of hope with an inheritance to come, that liberates us from having to be the same as everyone else. They are thinking materially about the material things of this world, and we are freed from that. We are free to enjoy the material things of this world, but we don't set our hopes there. Our hope is not to become this, and then this, and then this. No, no, no. Our hope is set on the inheritance to be given in the next world. So Peter says, set your hope on what is to come. May your eyes and your heart and your mind be longing for the life of the world to come, the day when Christ returns. And verse 13 is all about training our minds to be thinking ahead to that day, to fix our minds on that day, and then to work backwards. How we live in this life is to be determined by that day. That's why he says, prepare your minds for action. You have to think about how to live in this life as a result of thinking of the life of the world to come. Remember what is ahead. Uh, we have a, uh, a few interns at staff, and one of them had a particular interest in uh, discovering words in the English language that no one else knows. And he used to put them up on, it, on a whiteboard, and he'd do one word a week. One of his words was the word codywomple. Does anyone know? It's a verb, to codywomple. Do you know Michael Drake? You're nodding. Well, I've got it down here as being to, to head purposefully in an uncertain direction. <laughs> in other words, to walk confidently without knowing where you're going. Now, there's a lot of people in life who I think are codywompling. They're walking certainly without actually knowing where the end point is, that type of thing. The Christian does know where the end point is, so no codywompling. Uh, I don't want to see any codywompling from people. Rather, we are to train our minds like a laser to be honed for that day. We are to think about the day when Christ returns, and we're to live in the light of it here. And that takes some effort. It takes, as he says, self-control. It takes a certain resilience, a determination to be fixed on that day and to live in the light of it. But when you think about it, it's a practice that's not completely uncommon within this life. I mean, you think about a couple getting married, and from you know, that far out, let's say the bride is able to tell you how many days it is until the wedding. Um, the, the minds of the couple are fixed on that day in the calendar, and if they're wise, on the life that follows afterwards. Now, just imagine that only one of them had their mind fixed on that day, you know? Imagine a couple of weeks before the wedding, the bride gets out the, um, uh, the table plans uh, to run over them. It would be odd if the groom responded by getting out some um, building plans of a, a shed of a friend that he's, uh, he said that he'll help her sort of construct in the next two weeks. Uh, and it'd be odd if, if she can't get him to focus on the sort of reception because he's sort of so busy with this thing here. And it would be a bit odd if on the morning of the wedding he's down at the hardware sort of store and someone sees him with an hour to go uh, and he's still there sort of mucking around with it, the materials for the shed. No, 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 you've got something more important coming up. And really your life, if you know what's good for you, ought to be geared around what is about to happen. Now Peter here urges us, therefore, to fix our sights laser-like on that day the day when Christ returns. And it's not an easy thing to do. This is what it is to live by faith and not by sight. It is by faith to see the return of Jesus and to fix our eyes and to live in the meantime with that day in mind. Martin Luther said he only had two days in his calendar. Today, 
and as he called it, that day, the day of Christ's return. Because we have a hope, we are to be focused Christians. Then secondly, because we are because we are holy people, because we are hopeful people, we're focused Christians, because we're holy people, we should live different lives. How should we get ready for that day? We get ready by living holy lives. Verse 14, as obedient children, don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. To be holy means to be separate, means to be different, means to be set aside, to be consecrated. If you know the Old Testament and the Old Testament law, uh, a book like the book of uh, Leviticus or some of the laws in uh, Exodus or um, uh, Numbers or Deuteronomy, uh, they are the, the holiness code given to the Israelites to impress upon them they were not to be like everyone else. And uh, the sort of short story for reading some of those weird and wonderful rules is that this was to make the people different to those around. Now, as New Covenant believers, same for us. We are holy people. We've been set aside, sanctified by the Spirit, we learnt in chapter 1, verse 2. And now we are to live that out by being holy people. As obedient children, don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Don't just be like everyone else. Don't fall for the sin of being normal. You're not to be normal. You're different people, so live differently. Now, one of the areas that Peter applies that, looking a little bit further down, is in the command to love your Christian family. Have a look at verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. So rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Rather, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk. So by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted and seen that the Lord is is good. Okay, now that you already have this sincere love, he says, love one another deeply from the heart. This is one of the chief ways that we show we are different people. We show that, we sh show that we're different to how the world is, and we show that we are different to how we used to be. We show it in the love that we have for our brothers and sisters. Our view of other Christians is to be transformed. We're not to be like a club as in any other club on the university campus. Um, another club, whether it's know, hockey or bridge club or climbing or you know, whatever it is, people come as individuals, common shared interests, and then they leave as individuals. But this is about being part of the same family. That's why he says in verse 14, as obedient children. We have God as our heavenly father, Jesus Christ as our brother, and other Christians as our brothers or sisters, and now we show that we are holy people, different people, by loving the family of which we are now a part. Uh, and one reason to do that, as he shows in those uh, verses 23 to 25, is because we have been born forever with them. That is, through the word of God, we're going to live in eternity with them. So better get used to it now. Uh, we're in the same family forever and ever. So bring down a piece of heaven to earth in our relationships. We're to love one another deeply from the heart. This speaks of living an other person-centered life within the family of believers. Now, I actually think this is um, one of the more surprising consequences of becoming a Christian. Surprising in the sense that uh, if you'd asked me before I became a Christian, what kind of things are likely to change, I think I would have been able to probably take a guess at one or two areas of life that needed ironing out. But I don't think it would have occurred to me that the way I would think of Christians and the way I would relate to Christians would change. I didn't think of Christians before I was a Christian, didn't cross my radar, and it wouldn't have occurred to me to think that was a bit, big difference. But in the pages of the New Testament, it is one of the most fundamental differences it's a huge difference. How do you show you love God who you cannot see, but by loving his people who you can see, who God has put in front of us? And this works itself out, of course, in a whole host of ways. Let me suggest a few to us. In our delight 
in seeing them, in wanting to see them. I mean, he says here, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. That implies that you want to be with them. And when you meet together in Christian groups or Sunday church, you are saying, I will be there for you whether you are there or not. You know where I am coming for you. I'm coming to meet with you. You know how it is when you first become a Christian, it's all you can do to find the, um, uh, the Christian group or Sunday church uh, and to remember, you know, what building's it in and what day and, and what time and whatever. And that's, uh, that's sort of, if you can do that, tick, 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 fantastic. But after a while, it opens your eyes to, uh, God opens your eyes to the fact there are other people who I'm meeting with. And then you learn they're my family. And in fact, one of the reasons to come is for them rather than just for myself. I am coming to bring encouragement to you. And my experience over the years is that people always underplay the encouragement they bring to other people. When I left college, I went to uh, London for my first uh, job, and uh, I was working there in a, um, in a bank, and I was part of a, a Bible study at the local church, and uh, not been a Christian terribly long, so I was still sort of finding my feet a bit. And uh, there was a fellow who was in the Bible study by the name of Graham. And Graham was in a, a, a job, a, a graduate job, and he worked for a firm that was notorious in the way it uh, used and abused its um, uh, staff. And uh, he worked every hour of the day and night, plus a few more besides. When it came to uh, Bible study, what it was, we all sort of came from work, and uh, we'd get there, I think, uh, they, they served a bit of food at about um, 6.30, and I think the Bible study started at 7.30, and then uh, would finish at 9. At 7.45, Graham would appear, and he would have run from his office, and would run down, and would get there for 7.45. At 9 o'clock, Graham would disappear, and would send his apologies, I'm so sorry, I've got to go, and he would run back to the office, and keep working. Now this would happen week after week, and I think in that whole year, I don't think he missed a single study. Now you think of the pressure you're under every week, not had dinner, feel tired, I'm under pressure, there's always more work to do. Every week you've got six reasons not to go. But it taught me a lesson, I've never seen him since, and I will never forget Graham Browning, because he taught me a lesson which was that when you meet with other Christians, you do it for them as much as for yourself. And I was encouraged, and I'm sure everyone else was too. Uh, okay, uh, it affects um, our initiative. It's easy to sit on your heels, sit on your haunches. But when you have a love for your brothers, your eyes begin to be opened to what needs doing. Okay, so what needs doing here? What are the ways in which I can serve? And a healthy Christian group and a healthy church will be one where there is a wonderful volunteer culture. A volunteer culture is one where people not only stick up their hands when asked, but see things that need to be done. Or volunteer, what can happen when I do it? I think uh, I've had it twice where someone has um, come to church in the last few years, they've walked in and on their first Sunday, they've said, I just wondered, is there anything that needs doing here? <laughs> now you might say, well, you know, take a bit of time, you can sort of play yourself in. But um, it's a wonderful attitude to have and then that needs doing here. It's a love for other people. Um, that affects what happens actually when you're in a small group. Um, I think, uh, when you're part of a small group, like a small group Bible study, um, easy to feed from the word and think, you know, this is what it is. But there's a bit more than that. I think for about the first 10 years of my going to Bible, Bible studies, I thought the purpose of it was to get the right answer, you know? So someone throws out a question, Meh, and you put your hand on the buzzer and try and get in first. Isn't that the idea? You get the right answer, Meh, you know, that type of thing. And then again, your eyes are open to the fact, no, no, there's other people here. Part of the reason for is to encourage them in that. Okay, this is all to do with loving brothers and sisters deeply in the Lord. Uh, sometimes it shows in um, uh, having our eyes open to particular needs that people have. What does this person need during the week? Is there any way that I can help them? Sometimes it shows in terms of the uh, enduring... Uh, endurance in service over a long period. Uh, we were meeting as a church in a school hall that was, um, it looked like this, but without the heating. And it was uh, absolutely freezing, sort of 
icicles coming off on a Sunday morning. And there were people there who served for 10 years straight. There was one man that came in um, two hours before the service. I think he came every week for 10 years. I, don't, I think he hardly missed a week to set up the, the sounds, you know, the speakers and the, the whatnot. He did it every single week, week after week and month after month. Well, there is love for your brothers and sisters. Love for brothers and sisters also shows itself in what happens when things go wrong in relationships. We're human, things do go wrong. We say things we shouldn't have said. Uh, and uh, from time to time, you can feel uh, each other banging up against each other. That's what happens in a sinful world, okay? The question is, as Christians, what do we do about that? The world is more likely to press cancel on relationships. Difficult relationship, boop, cancel, gone. Um, but for Christians, that's not enough. To love brothers and sisters deeply might mean to say to them, Sorry, I found it a bit difficult what you said. You probably didn't mean to, but I found it a bit difficult. Can I say why? And then on the other hand, to apologize when we've done the thing that is wrong. Okay. So there are this one command to have sincere love for your brothers works out in a million ways. Let me ask you, where is your weak spot? Do you keep yourself to yourself? You're not likely to volunteer. Do you view love in negative terms? Well, you know, I've not done anything wrong to people. So what's the problem with that? No, 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 but love is positive. It's what can we do for people? Um, do you like to be acknowledged? Do you, do you feel the need to be needed? Do you love to be loved? Rather than doing something for the good of other people. These are many different ways in which we're to love each other. Peter says you're people of hope, so live focused lives. You are people of holiness, so live different lives. And then in this last section, from chapter 2 and verse 4 onwards. He says, you are people of God, so live good lives. You're people of God, so live good lives. And I do wonder in our current culture whether, whether this is not a, uh, an area where we stumble into a wonderful thing uh, which uh, is of huge help when it comes to mission. People will not like the Christian message necessarily. Um, but what they may find harder to resist is the goodness that that message produces. Here, perhaps, is our strongest apologetic, that when people see the good that you do as a Christian student, they are more likely to be receptive to the message that you say to them. When they see the difference that it makes, they may have thought, oh, you know, this is a terrible, hateful message you have. But hang on a second. It is producing some wonderful things. I'm actually rather intrigued, not to say attracted. Now, I think that's how this works here. Because you see where he ends up. He ends up in verse 12 saying, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Okay, let's have a think about this section. Much of the language that is used here is Old Testament language to describe what God is doing. And what he does is take truths from the Old Testament and apply it to these people he is speaking of here, these New Testament believers. Ever since the Garden of Eden, when people had first sinned against God, uh, humanity and God had been separated. But then, as you may know, in the Old Testament, God makes this glittering set of promises to be with his people. And at first, he fulfills this through the tabernacle, that portable tent at the time of the Exodus. Then through the temple, the uh, bricks and mortar building that um, uh, Solomon built. But finally, through the Lord Jesus Christ, when the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And as Jesus invites people to believe in him, he is invite inviting them to be part of a gathering of people who would form a new building across the world. Now that's what he's talking about here when he talks in verse 4 about this living stone rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him. You also like living stones are being built into the spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. He's talking about the gathering of people, the gathering that God is gathering together across this world. You notice three things about it. First of all, it's a building that is founded on Jesus Christ. Verse 4, as you come to him, the living stone. Uh, verse 6, a chosen and precious cornerstone. Talking about Jesus. 
In other words, you become part of this building, a person becomes part of this building by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. As soon as they have their faith in Jesus, it's another brick in the wall, so to speak. You imagine the building that God is building, and every time a person becomes a Christian, it's a new brick up the top, okay? So the building is going up. Um, and uh, I was speaking to a student a few days ago. Uh, she'd become a Christian in the last week. I thought that was exciting. Then I spoke to another student who'd become a Christian the day before. So every time, one brick, and there's another brick, okay, all across the world. That's why our mission is to introduce people to Jesus. I think I said last night how I became a Christian when someone said, what's your view of God? And then they said, what's your view of Jesus? There's no better question to ask someone. Once you start talking about Jesus, we are batting on the wicket we want to be on. This is what we have to do in mission, introduce people to him. Okay, it's a building that is built on Jesus. It's a building that is spiritual. In the Old Testament, the temple was literal, physical, but this is not, verse 5, it is a spiritual house. So this gathering that God is gathering of people is a spiritual house. Spiritual because we're united by the Holy Spirit of God. We have an invisible bond, together with all Christians from around the world, and down the ages. We're different in background and nationality and personality. We have an invisible bond that unites us together. We're in this together, and that's why we have the same mission. People everywhere, Christians everywhere, Ecuador, or Africa, or Asia, or Europe, or Australasia, or your campus, same mission everywhere, to introduce people to Jesus Christ. It's a building that is spiritual, and notice it's a building that divides people. To those who believe, Verse 7, this stone is precious because in verse 6, they will never be put to shame. Isn't that wonderful? The Christian will never be put to shame. Maybe this is the one area where our memory, unfortunately, is better than God's. God does not remember our sins. It is a cast iron promise. He will remember their sins no more. And the Bible has some wonderful ways to describe that. It talks about how God um, uh, takes our sins as far as the east is from the west. In other words, I can't see them. I can't see them. They're over the horizon. It talks about how God has our sins uh, behind his back. He can't see them. It talks about how he has put our sins at the bottom of the sea. He can't see them. And so when we remember our sins in a moment of guilt, we need to remember that God cannot. He will remember their sins no more. There is no shame. This is wonderful, wonderful news. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. You have to believe, and there will be those who don't. They disobey the message. In other words, God was not going to be caught out by this. He knew it would happen, and neither should we be. There will always be people who reject the message. We should not be discouraged. Okay, so what he's saying here, verse 9, is that you are now this chosen people. He says you are a royal priesthood. In other words, God mediates the knowledge of himself through ordinary people like us. God could have done it any way he wanted. God could have sent an army of angels from heaven to declare the good news. He could have done a leaflet drop from heaven to declare the good news. But instead, guess what? He decided to use ordinary people like you and me. And you know why? Yes, because we are the best possible demonstration of this message. This is a message that sinners are saved by grace. And you know how I know that's true? Because I'm a sinner who's been saved by grace. And so are you. That's how we can speak of this with conviction. You are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Now see what comes out of this. This is our mission, our speech and our life, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his life. There's the speech. But look at the life in verse 11 and 12. I urge you as alien exiles in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. Now, I think these are wonderful words. As God's people, we are to live good lives. They're wonderful words because they're so simple. What this means is that in the power of God, we're to open our eyes 
to the good that we can do, and then we are to do it every day to the maximum of our ability. That's what it is, to open our eyes. Now you see there, he says in verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans. So it's fantastic when students live among other non-Christian students, uh, when you are mixing with other non-Christian students, in the lectures, in the halls, in the, in the flat where you live perhaps, or wherever. In so far as you are able to live a godly life, go as far as you can into the world. Um, if there is somewhere that causes you to stumble, get out from it. But as far as you are able to live a godly life, you get yourself into the world. Live such good lives among the pagans. We're not to be in holy huddles all the time. We're to mix with those around. But as you do so, live such good lives. Live good lives as the people of God. It's so simple and it's so positive. We're looking for ways to do good. I take our kids to school in the morning and beforehand I try and say a prayer before they get out of the car. Um, I have to keep the car sort of moving forward slowly, otherwise they just sort of uh, disperse. But um, uh, as, as we just sort of come to a uh, halt, I say, Lord, please open our eyes to do good to others around us today and then help us to do that good. I don't know what happens after that, but anyway, we've said the prayer. Now, um, our aim, therefore, is to do as much good as we can to as many people as we can, as much of the time as we possibly can. It begins by taking the trouble, I think, to speak to people, to show an interest in people, uh, to uh, ask questions of people, uh, to show an interest in the people. You see, as Christians, you've always got a greater incentive than non-Christians to take an interest in other people. And the um, rule of thumb is this, the most important person in the world is the person that you're speaking to at any one time. So wherever God puts you on a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday or Friday, the person who is in front of you is the most important person in the world. So speak to them and take an interest in them. Uh, maybe there are opportunities then to do something enjoyable on a Saturday or to, um, uh, to um, share something with them or share course books with them or offer to help them or in some way. However it works out exactly, we're to be the best friend, the best colleague, the best flatmate, the best teammate that we possibly can be. I came from a non-Christian home, and uh, when I'd not been a Christian long, I asked, uh, I asked someone, have you got any advice for me in terms of relating to my mum and dad who weren't Christians? They said, yes. They said two things. One, be, one, show that following Jesus makes you more joyful, because any parent wants their children to be happy, and they won't complain if you're more happy. And secondly, be the best son you can be because they won't complain at that either. And I thought that was two good bits of advice. That's what we're to be, uh, to be as good as we can to those around, the best friend, the best colleague, the best flatmate, the best teammate, the best son or daughter. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, that is, they may not always appreciate it, nor oh, those terrible Christians, nonetheless, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us, which I think means they will have been converted by that day. You see, what we're seeing here, to summarize, is that evangelism and good deeds go hand in hand. It's not one or the other, it is both together. And I'll tell you a last story just to illustrate that. There was a wonderful evangelist from yesteryear called John Chapman. He died 10 years ago uh, this year, and some of you may have known him. Uh, he was the greatest evangelist I've really heard, and uh, I'd heard him many, many times. When he was an older man, I went to visit him in his flat in Sydney, and I knocked on the door, and uh, he came and opened it. He suffered from ill health uh, quite a bit in his last years, and uh, not able to get out too much. Uh, I went to see him in the flat, and I went in there, and he sat down in the chair where he'd been, um, where he'd been sitting. And I noticed what he'd been doing. John Chapman was a bachelor, and he had been knitting jumpers for children in Africa while he was uh, sitting there, you see. It's a thing. And suddenly, the penny dropped in my mind. Of course, that's how John Chapman treats people. He loves people. And his evangelism flowed out of a love for people. His evangelism was not a bolt-on extra to his life, 
like I do this, plus I find I can give talks. No, no, no. His evangelism flowed out of his love for people. He wanted to see them saved. But the truth was that good works flowed out of his being at every pore. Every person mattered to John Chapman. The person in the dairy, the person uh, on the side of the street, the person he'd been a lift with, the person you would only meet once in life. Every person mattered. And that was why he was knitting jumpers for kids he would never meet in Africa. You see, evangelism and good deeds go hand in hand, and they flow out from who we are. We are people of hope, so live focused lives. We're people of holiness, so live different lives. We are the people of God, so live good lives, which reflect the God we serve. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have saved us to glorify you and to bring the good news of the gospel into the world. And we pray that you would work within us by the power of your spirit to help us live good lives, lives which would honor you, uh, lives which would uh, prepare the ground for the gospel, lives which would attract people to hear about Jesus. Please, we pray, would you help us in this? And we do pray that you would use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.